when you're when you're in adulthood, it's actually pretty difficult to acquire new microbes. And I think when someone goes and takes a probiotic, they may think, well, you know, I'm taking these external microbes. Um, you know, they're going to take up residence in my gut, and they're going to basically, I'm going to get good microbes and maybe get <laughs> get rid of the bad microbes. But really, the gut microbiome is coloniz colonization um, colonization limited, meaning kind of what you have is is what you have. Now you can shift those levels, you can toggle those levels, or or perhaps you know, say you have a really heavy dose of antibiotics, perhaps kill off a, a large part of that. But it's very very difficult, uh, and and current literature doesn't support just bringing on or onboarding new microbes. Now, that's not to say there's not opportunities uh, to augment um, or condition the microbiota to better receive different therapies, but we have to understand what those therapies are doing. It's like specific, uh, specifically if we're talking about probiotics. Okay. So, so essentially like, I mean, to dumb this down extensively, and I know you're going to get into this, but for one person to drink a type of kombucha, it might have a positive effect because their microbiome is uh, accepting of the microbes that are within that. For another individual though, they don't have that species or that type of bacteria in their gut. And therefore it's just not gonna colonize and take place as a positive thing within the gut. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so that's where profiling the gut microbiome comes in because if you have a better understanding of what the landscape looks like and what kind of functionality you're dealing with, then you can be a lot more targeted with the type of therapy that you're introducing. Uh, and you can not guarantee, but at least um, set yourself up for having a, basically a better acceptance, a better response uh, from that modality. Now, when people think about changing or affecting the microbiome, their minds immediately go to probiotics. And that makes sense. I mean, probiotics are, the basic definition here I have are comprised of live microorganisms, meaning the product that you're taking literally has, like you'll read on the back of a, a, a you know, supplement or you know, a particular type of supplemental food, culture forming units. CFUs, meaning if I was to culture that, they you know should grow and, and form into colonies. So um, yeah, these are comprised of live microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. This is the official definition. And you notice in that definition, nowhere does it say that they're going to take up residence. No way does it, nowhere does it say that they're going to change the composition of your microbiome. It's actually very vague language conferring a health benefit on the host. Well, there's a inverse to this as well. So people think about the probiotics and how that can have a positive impact on the gut because we're colonizing it with more bacteria now. But on the other side of it, uh, something that I've heard, and I'm not sure if you, you've come across it much, but that over sterilization can have a negative effect. And, and this is anecdotal. This is not from researchers. This is just kind of from out in the ether, how people communicate and talk about and think about these things, but that over sterilization of the environment can be bad for the microbiome because you're not intaking new bacteria. Is that not so much the case then, or, or what are your thoughts on that? No, that's actually, uh, very much the case. Um, you know, there's a pretty classic study showing that, uh, different environmental factors like being around livestock, actually, uh, being around, you know, household pets, these are actually seen as beneficial things because they're providing, particularly when you're a younger individual and you're able to take on these different potential passengers, create a more diverse microbiome. The other part of this that I'll get into in a second is training your immune system. So a lot of it isn't necessarily that the microbes are coming in and just taking up residence. It's that you're getting microbes trans and, uh, being transit, uh, transitory um, into your gastrointestinal tract, but interacting with your immune system and kind of training it so it can understand, okay, this is what I need to, uh, you know, uh, adapt to potentially in the future uh, to limit, you know, different uh, potential perturbations okay, so or it's... inflammatory responses. It's really a training uh, that's occurring. Yeah. So, so it's essentially that we are developing the antibodies and different things that are needed for, for future exposure to those things. 
Correct. And uh, in terms of probiotics, of course, uh, I, I'm not sure people just know how um, prevalent they are. I mean, they're actually the the uh, third most commonly used dietary supplement among amongst adults, according to the uh, U.S. National Health Interview Survey anyway. Uh, and we find them in supplements. I mean, that's where your mind goes to first, but also yogurts, of course, fermented foods like uh, sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, tempeh, uh, certain types of pickles, kefir, kombucha, you mentioned cheeses. Now there's even elixirs, you know, shots and drinks. And of course, uh, those more traditional foods like sourdough bread. So they're highly prevalent. But what most people don't understand is, oh, I'm taking a probiotic. Well, okay, that's nice that you're taking a probiotic, but what type of probiotic are you taking? When we actually, because it's a live organism, we actually uh, classify it, you know, we're applying taxonomy. What is the domain? You know, what is the phylum, the class, order, family, all the way down to the strain level? What we know is uh, probiotics are highly strain specific, meaning different types of strains, different types of functions, right? So, you know, some of the most common I have here as an example, lactobacillus, when someone talks about the different types of probiotics they're taking, generally they're only at the uh, genus level resolution. I'm taking bifidobacterium, or I'm taking lactobacillus. It's not, it's not very common that you'll actually hear someone call out the specific strain. Lactobacillus reminosus GG, for instance, pretty common strain. Now, why this is important uh, is when we look, say I have here human as kind of a side-by-side a, a -side comparison. When we look at the difference, say, between uh, a human and other primates, or uh, you know how how uh, similar their their DNA is, like the DNA DNA reassociation. Um, for probiotics to be classified within the same species, they only have to have seventy percent DNA DNA reassociation. So <laughs> when we look at the difference, and we would say that in terms of like a human to a gorilla, that's a pretty big difference, but the DNA uh, DNA reassociation is only 97.7%. Uh, so, I mean, small differences can be big differences, right? Um, all the way down to say a lemur, uh, which is this guy right here, that's a DNA DNA uh, reassociation rate of 78%. So these if we were applying this to different types of probiotics, I have lactobacillus kind of used as an example here, acidophilus, for instance, as a species, these would all be categorized in the, in the same species. And these are all very, very different. Uh, of course, we know that these, um, you know, these species do different things, right? Uh, so it's very important to keep that in mind. And I always advocate when you're taking a probiotic, understand why you're taking it, uh, because Again, the health benefits, we have to really think about this at the strain level based on what they're doing. Um, and you want to be targeted with what you're doing. I think people oftentimes will take a product um, simply because, oh, that's going to help with gut health. Uh, well, are you having gut problems? What kind of gut problems are you having? What are you taking the most targeted therapy you can be? Uh, and of course, you know, another, another thing we see now is uh, multi-species probiotics. I'm more a fan of really finding modalities that are, are going to move the needle. And there's not to say that there's not application for this, but I'm just saying, you know, kind of pulling back a little bit and seeing what's going to kind of give you the most bang for your buck, um, particularly when it comes to things like dietary supplements. Yeah. Now, yeah. So you're saying with like the, the human to the lemur analogy that if you're just taking lactobacillus, there are further strains that can really specify what exactly that you're taking, what, what you are taking. So the difference could be potentially as much of a difference as there is between a human or a lemur. Right. Exactly. Yep. That that's, that's why I pulled that example. And I also kind of provide this other, um, other example when we look at, so say I was to take out your gastrointestinal tract and kind of spread it out, looking at the surface area, we're talking about 200, um, meters squared of gas of gastrointestinal mucosa or surface area that everything that's coming into my gastrointestinal tract. I mean, that's the surface area that's dealing with, whether it be food 
whether it be water, whether it be microbial. I mean, that's that's over 2,000 square feet. That's that's a house for a family, basically. So when we're talking about you know taking in probiotics, we have to kind of take that into the grand scheme of things. I'm not I'm not trying to completely downplay probiotics altogether. I'm just saying uh, clearly this is a very complex, large environment. Um, that these relatively small, um, oftentimes infrequent um, exposures are coming in. Because if you talk to somebody, I don't know very many people that have taken probiotics for years on end or decades on end. Um, now that would be you know, pretty significant, but most people are taking this for a few months. Uh, and maybe that's, um, maybe that's in terms of like maybe mitigating like traveler's diarrhea or you know, you're trying to rebound from antibiotic exposure, something that you brought up, um, Micah, maybe that would be a more targeted approach. Um, but in, in terms of what this, what this is actually interacting with, it's also uh, considering the immune system. 70% um, of immune cells are actually located around the gastrointestinal tract. Well, I have a question then. So it, we talked about the fecal transplant that was used in mice, and I know you've done some other work with that as well. Why would that work for inoculating and, and assisting the microbiome as opposed to taking probiotics? Well, think about it. If, again, I'm not advocating anybody do this because we're not mice and we're not corporophagic and we shouldn't be eating our own feces. Well, but, under a guided physician and and right, 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 right. Now right. that there are there are fecal microbiome transplants available, um, but the sheer quantity of microbes that you're taking in uh, is not comparing to the small amount of microbes that you're taking in through a, a product, right? Colony forming units that are coming in, just particularly if you're eating, you know, a whole bowel movement. In the instance of those animals, uh, you're getting a lot of microbes come in. Does sourcing um, have anything to do with it as far as the microbes and how they're sourced? Because I mean, just an oversimplified viewpoint of it might be that the uh, fecal transplant would be using species that are accustomed to the gut as opposed to species that perhaps have never even seen a gut lining. Yeah, that's a that's a, an excellent point and it's sp totally spot on, um, you know, although a lot of the probiotic preparations to be fair um, you know, have been found to be in a normal, normal gut microbiota, but that person that is receiving it may not have ever had exposure to that or infrequent exposure, or that isn't a microbe that's had permanent residence in their gut. So they're going to be less accepting of it. Right. Uh, the other part to bring in is the stability of the gut microbiome. Um, you know, 60% and this famous study by Faith et al. in 2013 published in Science, 60% of the microbiome composition uh, in U.S. adults was found to be stable for a, a five-year period. So highly, highly, highly stable. It's pretty hard, hard to perturb it. Um, moreover, in a, in a study that I published looking at probiotic supplementation, um, specifically looking at immune um, and inflammatory markers in healthy adults, really doesn't have, uh, of the studies that we extracted uh, in the syst uh, systematic review, it really has a limited effect on immune and inflammatory markers. One of the principal areas that are one of the uh, main mechanisms of action proposed uh, by probiotic use. So I, in my opinion, probiotics, I think have a lot of utility, they just have to have targeted use. You have to have a good use case to use them. You shouldn't really just be taking them indiscriminately. And that comes back to better profiling uh, or profiling period, your microbiome and how you might be receptive to any one particular intervention, any one particular modality, any one particular probiotic strain. Some people may, uh, based on a particular health condition, a gastrointestinal condition, um, may benefit from that. Uh, other individuals, you know, they may be traveling um, to a foreign area. They may have diarrhea. You know, there might be a use case for those type of scenarios. But just indiscriminately taking probiotics, I'm uh, I'm completely against. So, 
is there a downside to taking indiscriminately taking probiotics uh, outside of obviously time, money, and focus? Like you could be focused on the wrong thing, thinking it's helping, but it's not actually helping. Is there a downside health wise to taking probiotics? There are. There's very few evidence that I've come across showing that indiscriminately taking probiotics or even you know taking too many probiotics could adversely affect you. Um, I think the amount that you'd have to take is just, it's, it's absurd. You'd have to, you know, take, you know, uh, tr yeah, like the whole uh, trillions, you'd have to something. take trillions yeah. of colony forming units. Um, they're generally recognized as safe. Again, you, most of your immune system is located around your gastrointestinal tract. So it's very good at kind of handling that. Um, I think the point that you made at the beginning was, was, what I'm thinking of is I, I always like to approach things, uh, parsimoniously, you know, only doing what, what's really going to be, uh, you know, the best, uh, and, and the most focused. Otherwise you're just really wasting time and resource, which I, I think most people would agree. What, why even bother doing that? And I think that ties nicely into, um, really what are going to be the best things in forming um, a more resilient microbiome? Like what are the prime movers of that? The, you can think of them as like ecological pressures. So, I mean, as an adult, as I was just saying, you're, you're going to have a pretty stable microbiome. That's not to say things can't change or you can't maybe encourage your microbiome uh, to shift state to some degree. It will take a little bit longer of a period. It's really going to have to be pretty pervasive things like, diet is it, everyone is eating. Okay. Pretty much on a daily basis, unless you're engaged in, in some sort of fasting or something like that. But diet is really one of the main prime movers of forming, um, your microbiome, encouraging the growth or, uh, persistence of different types of microbes. Now, making sure that you have a more diverse or trying to ensure that you have a more diverse microbiome, I would recommend having a more diverse, uh, diet. Uh, obviously tailored to your own health needs uh, and quote unquote healthy, whatever the, the, you know, healthy is in your particular context, but dietary diversity is very important in terms of offering a wide array of different nutrients and not just those that we normally think of in terms of like macronutrients, fats, carbohydrates, et cetera, um, or micronutrients, but also all the polyphenols, you know, the, the phytochemicals that we're getting that we don't really have quantified on a food label, but we, inherently know, uh, we get when we're eating a, a diverse diet, you know, whether I'm seeking diversity in food source, you know, I'm not eating the exact same, say type of meat all the time. I'm not eating the exact same type of vegetables. Uh, I'm trying to get a diverse array of different, uh, different items in others. Well, of in course, exercise, they call that muscle confusion, right? Is changing up the the format that you use to exercise the type of movements that you're using so that your body can adapt more strongly. And it sounds like this is similar in the respect that uh, staying on the same food, same type of diet day in and day out, isn't necessarily the, the most positive thing. I mean, if you think about it in nature, it's like, what are you eating? You're, you're eating seasonally available and therefore diverse foods according to the season that you're in. Yes, that's, that's, that's spot on. Also, um, you know, we're not, we're not normally, or humans weren't normally eating all the time. A season is a good example. In winter, things were more scarce. You might've gone, you know, um, you might've eaten, your caloric load might've been decreased. Uh, you may not have been eating in the same time windows. All, this, all diversity of exposure is a good way to put it. Uh, and that can be a really good thing. I mean, regimen, uh, as we know, in terms of persistence, as you're saying with exercise, we know regimens important, but varying the stimulus um, on the acute scale can be certainly important. Uh, I mean, a lot of these in terms of the ecological pressures are kind of intuitive, exercise regularly, make sure you get enough restful sleep, stay hydrated. All these things we know that we should be doing um, to really stay healthy, but these tie into gut resilience uh, occurring kind of through other, other, other mechanisms. Like hydration is important in terms of the transit time that it takes, uh, for say a, an item to pass through your gastrointestinal tract transit time. Um, 
is is important because that can actually affect the um, uh, the uh, the pH uh, that's inside. That's basically the the pH of your uh, colonic lumen, which you know can alter the composition of your gut microbiota. Are you having a more acidic? Are you having a more basic microbiota that can totally change the landscape of your gut microbiome with just something as simple as say staying hydrated and exercising. So there's kind of look at the underlying reasons for uh, the importance of this is actually pretty, uh, pretty important. I mean, for instance, if you're, if you're doing, if you're engaged in regular physical activity, regular endurance exercise, that can completely change your gastrointestinal, uh, your gastrointestinal transit time, meaning you're more regular or you should be more regular unless you're over exercising. In fact, this is commonly prescribed to middle-aged individuals um, with chronic constipation. Well, go exercise. You're going to, you're going to have more frequent bowel movements. Um, and just to clarify, that says moderate antibiotic use in the sense of don't increase to moderate, but moderate. Yes. I don't want to say completely eliminate antibiotic use. Number one, um, antibiotics certainly have a, uh, a place in medicine and their use uh, can be life-saving. However, indiscriminate use, we already know, can be very, very damaging. Uh, so you need to, you know, you need to be careful, obviously, with antibiotics, but they do have indication. Uh, they do have indication in certain instances. So is um, this, uh, this pyramid in order of most important to least important? Grossly. I mean, it's all going to be yeah. context-dependent, but sure. yeah. And so you see... It's not really till we get to the bottom where we, we start seeing things like supplements, like prebiotics, which are things basically like fermentable type fibers or, or fermentable type products that can come in and, and have microorganisms that are already in your gastrointestinal tract work on them uh, all the way to the bottom. If you may not be able to read that font, uh, probiotics. So in terms of, you know, what, what I think you should be prioritizing in terms of increasing not only gut resilience, but also gut health overall, I think probiotics should generally be lower on the list. That's not to say for someone that really has a good use case, they might, you know, increase up in terms of the, the, the priority. Uh, but for most healthy individuals, I'd pretty, I put them pretty low, um, pretty low on the list. And would that be in the same part in the list if you had directly targeted the strain uh, that is needed for that person? So again, it, it depends on what it's their health, right? Yeah, yeah, it depends on what health need. But I mean, if you're able to, uh, if you're able to find a specific strain that that individual would benefit from, I think there's some recent uh, exciting strains that are now available on the market, such as Acromantia and Eucinophilia. That is really common. Uh, in fact, most individuals have that microbe. So that's a little bit different than taking you know, some uh, bifidobacterium strain that someone might, m most people don't have. Um, Acromantium eucinophilia, if you're finding that individual has a decrease in the amount of mucus that they have around their gut barrier, they're having issues with gut permeability, that might be a better use case, but you really have to identify that first rather than just start taking that. So in that case, yeah, that might bump up a few spots. But again, uh, overall, it's you're never going to um, you're never going to be able to be competitive with diet, um, you know, just just mainstays of healthy living, which I know yeah. a lot of people don't want to hear because we're looking for the silver bullet, but we really need to kind of pull ourselves back in a lot of these a lot of these circumstances, um, and that's why I'm such a fan of surveying the landscape. And as you see here in my in, in the pictures, I always like thinking about ecology. You know, having a diverse rainforest signifying a resilient microbiome versus a deforested, you know, rainforest that was pulverized by, um, you know, uh, logging <laughs> fr or whatever, French fry yeah. slashing and hamburger <laughs> bulldozers and all those other things. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, I think that's kind of an it's it's a nice image and it's 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 important to kind of think about it uh, in that way, uh, as well as you know, think about things simplistically in terms of. Well, yeah, a healthy diet makes sense. Uh, exercising regularly makes sense. The environment, though, uh, before you start implementing all those 
I think that really needs to be profiled because then you know what you're going into and really what takes priority and what you need to do. So, you know, what we've done with the Aristotle test in terms of uh, profiling the metabolome is great for your metabolism. Doing the same thing with the microbiome uh, with our uh, our uh, test that we're going to be rolling out this year, doing the same thing, understanding the landscape so we can be a lot more targeted um, you know, with what our recommendations are. But in terms of most people, this is, I, I think, the place to, to kind of, this is the place to start. Mm -hmm.